I am Dee Hopkins, Quality Accounts, Carolyn Fowler, Keynote Presentation, sorry, Charitable Fund, Andrew Williams, and the Keynote Presentation, many of our staff starring in that, and then questions. But before we move into the body of the meeting, it's also important for me for us to have a, a shared context. And we have a very strong shared purpose here in the in the trust. And it's our reason for being, it's our reason for getting up every day. And that's to remind ourselves we're here to improve the quality of people's lives in their home and community through delivering the best in integrated health and care. We often sum that up, which I love, as looking after you locally. And that's underpinned by three values that to me are our big differentiator here at NCHNC and they are community, compassion and creativity and again they are a great leveller in this trust shared by all who work here, shared and lived I should say. So our board for the year have been First of all, we've got the executive team led by our chief executive, Josie Spencer, our director of community health and care operations, Laura Clear, our deputy chief executive, John Webster, our director of nursing and quality, Carolyn Fowler, our medical director, Benu Harwell, and our director of finance, Andrew Hopkins. We have our non-executive directors who also sit on the board, Joe Parks, Graham Nice, Joe Kiliaxley, Steve Crow, Andrew Williams and Lorna Bailey. During the year, we've had some changes to the board. We said farewell to Paul Cracknell, who was our Deputy Chief Executive and Executive Director of Strategy and Transformation. We said welcome to John Webster, who joined us as Deputy CEO and Executive Director of Strategy and Transformation. We said welcome to Joe Parks as an Associate Non-Executive Director from PC Land. Uh, and we also said welcome to Sheila Layton, who's a non-executive director placement from NHSEI, so the next generation of non-executive directors. And we are also delighted to congratulate Carolyn Fowler, our director of nursing, who is now substantive. So... Thank you, and I'm going to hand you over to Josie. But before I do, just like to say, sit back and relax. This is our combined appraisal. Josie. So good morning, everybody. Um, I think most of you probably do know me, but for those that don't, I'm Josie Spencer. I'm the Trust Chief Executive, and I'm delighted that to begin with today, oh, I've gone the wrong way. That was a, we're going to start off by um, talking about our Staff Long Service Award. Now, many, many staff in the Trust have got long service. We recognise 10, 20, 30 and 40 years service in this Trust. And I know many of you have had your 10 and 20 year certificates sent out to your home, home address. Really sorry that this year, once again, COVID has meant that we can't do these things in person. Geraldine and I and the board would love to have done that and to see you all. So today what we've got on screen is a bit of a roll call for the 30 and 40 year um, mem sorry, the members of staff that have served 30 and some 40 years within the NHS, which is a real achievement. And, you know, we as a trust are very proud of all the service that you've given to the NHS, but I'm even more sure that the people that you serve and we've served over the years are also very grateful to you. So, in terms of the 30 year service, um, we've got congratulations to the following staff. And just bear with me while I get my little list out so I don't miss anybody. I would hate to miss anybody out. So, we've got Anita Larkin, Service Improvement Manager, Tracy Hayton, Community LD Nurse, Julie Trouse, Podiatrist, Caroline Kay, Community Nurse, Louise Emma Smith, Staff Nurse, Claire Hart, Advanced Nurse Practitioner, Kerry Jones, Head of IC Health, 
Rose Miller, technical instructor, Lynn Fanning, head of clinical education and research, Sharon Griffin, physiotherapist, Helen Sullivan, clinical lead nurse, Joe Briscoe, medical secretary, Elizabeth Bentley, senior triage clinician, Mary Rose Sheen, physiotherapist, and Carolyn Fowler, our director of nursing. Before we move on to the, the 40 year service, shall we give those members of staff a little round of applause just for people here in the room? And also, because we have got one of the people in the room that has got their service award, I'm not sure how, I mean, Carolyn will tell me off if I don't do this in a COVID safe way. I have got Carolyn's certificate um, to, to give her, but I'm not sure whether you're allowed to come up or what, do I put the mask back on? Yeah. I'll put the mask back on, I think I'm told, right? <laughs> one second. And I'll shut to, I shan't be able to shake hands, shall I? Can I do it? Yeah. No, I can't do any of those. Can I touch it? Yeah. Sorry, this is really well rehearsed and polished, as you can all see. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, if I can be like, for everyone else, uh, uh, so what, so what we will be doing, um, because obviously we couldn't get uh, people here today, is that we'll be making arrangements for those that wish to, to meet up with uh, myself, Geraldine, or one of the members of the board in your uh, place of work, um, if you're coming into work, to, oh, sorry, your, <laughs> your place of work, so we can actually um, hopefully congratulate you in person. I appreciate not everybody uh, would want to do that, so you will be given the option to either have it in the, the certificate posted to you or for meeting one of us in your in your place of work, hopefully very shortly. So now we move on to those members of staff that have had 40 years service, which I've had a long time in the NHS, but this even tops me. So we've got two members of staff that have had 40 years service. And again, I think we want to congratulate them individually. So they're Linda Seaman, who's a continence advisor, and Annette Paul, continent service lead. There must be something about continence that keeps people here. So congratulations to, to Lisa and so thank you and thank you everybody for, for um, all the service that you've done for everybody that with the test had 10, 20 and 30 and 40 years and for everybody this year that's given service to the NHS because I'll now move on to, to my brief presentation. It is very brief this year because we wanted to hopefully allow time at the end of the, the session for a video that, where, that shows our staff actually during the year and how brilliantly everybody's worked and pulled together in what's been um, a year like no other as I've put on the screen there. So I will keep this um, to one or two slides. Uh, we'll see the video at the end. I have seen the video already and um, it is very um, emotional in places, I would say. So um, we'll, we'll see how we all get on with that and when we get to it. So, as I say, a year like no other, what last year was for us all in the NHS. Um, I know how difficult it's been for many members of staff. I've just tried to pull a few of the high, highlights um, together just um, to get flavour um, for, for what's been going on. So, my experience has taught me is that, that beyond every successful organisation, it's only successful because of its talented, committed and diverse teams and all of the individuals that work in those teams. And for me, that, you know, that has show, shown itself day after day after day through the pandemic. It's been the most challenging year that we've had. Um, and certainly we've all tried to, to work together to ensure people feel valued and supported and, and really to, to ensure that we can recover as an organisation and continue to provide the, the high quality healthcare that we've always provided in NCHC that I've always been proud to be the chief executive of. So really difficult times. I know for many it remains so. Um, and, you know, we, we, we do understand and, and do our best to try and support as best we can. Um, and, and hopefully that will continue going forward. So at the start of the pandemic, we opened, it was, it was the beginning of the year we're talking about now. now. Um, the country went into lockdown. We opened our incident control centre immediately um, after we had the Prime Minister's speech. I think it was on a Monday night or Tuesday night and we opened the, the ICC almost immediately the next day. We opened it on the 23rd of March. We didn't expect for a minute that it would be open for the time that we were open, till, which as you can see from there was right through until the 14th of June. Um, of this year. I think most of us thought it'd be a couple of three months at, at most. So we really had no 
no idea what this pandemic was going to throw at us. And certainly you can see that's a picture of the ICC. We're now standing in what was the boardroom and um, where we had the ICC as well. So we've, we've, we've moved it, moved, moved on a little, but it was a, a hive of activity. And we were really grateful for many people within the organisation who actually um, stepped in to support the ICC from their jobs that they normally would do. And we were, you know, we, we had an outstanding group of staff working in the ICC during that period. And I was, as a chief executive, immensely grateful to them. Um, all sorts of things went on in the ICC. I've got a couple of um, you know, quotes. You know, the, 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 the thousands of actions we had to do. There's a lot of reporting back to, um, to obviously through to the national um, team um, and things that we had to do locally. But we did a really fantastic job. And once again, I just don't want to. I, I, I really want to make sure that everybody realises how thankful we were. Um, in clinical services, we, we had a, a, a number of changes. We, we opened additional beds. We were opening and closing beds all the time, red beds, green beds related to the pandemic. The maximum at any one time we had open was 23. We had a number of COVID patients in our beds, of course we did, and the maximum number at any one time was 104. And if you think our wards are about 24, 25 beds each, that's, that's you know, over four wards. Um, in terms of intermediate care, we, we changed most of our inpatient beds, as you know, were there for rehabilitation. But during COVID, we, we made them more generalist and we admitted 360 more patients this year than we had in the previous year. Um, and it's, it really, that's again, one complete additional ward for us. Um, and the, the, the community services were, were also doing, looking after COVID patients. And again, on our community caseloads, we had um, at one time 40 patients on our community case though. So COVID, as we know, was um, a real challenge for all clinical services in the NHS. Obviously, in the media, you often see what's going on in ITUs and acute hospitals. We, we always talk about, we sort of hide a little bit in the background, but certainly we had the pressure, not of not only of the, the lockdown and the pandemic, but also dealing with some very poorly, poorly patients. Um, and, and as always, we did a fantastic job. Um, PPE was a real theme at the beginning of the pandemic. We had obviously um, we had to you know, make sure our supply chain was working, that we got everything that we needed. There's a few um, uh, statistics on there. I know people um, like their statistics, but again, I, I just want to say it to the procurement team. I never had a sleepless night in this trust about the PPE being here because the team were fantastic, outstanding. We helped out other teams as well across the system. I won't name names in this presentation. You all know who you are. Um, and I, I know certainly in contact with other chief exec colleagues that they weren't all feeling the way I felt. We did a fantastic job and you know, staff out there and I am eternally grateful. We did that in the context of an ever-changing national policy around what the guidance was and that was changing because we were learning so it's not about fault it's just about an evolving situation but i do know for many of the staff on the front line that those changing clinical guidelines on a day-to-day -day basis caused a lot of stress and anxiety we did our best to alleviate that but i know that wasn't always the case so once again thank you for working with us through that i know how difficult it was and how frightening it must have been to be facing a, a, you know, a disease that we didn't really know a lot about with the PPE, not being sure from one day to the next what we were going to ask you to do with that. Um, but again, we got through that together, as, as we would expect, the fantastic team that we've got here to do that. But, you know, when you look at those numbers, they are astounding, you know, 4.5 million examination gloves. I've got no idea. It probably would fill this room, <laughs> that number of examination gloves. Five thousand litres of hand gel. I mean, Obviously, this is all off procurement, so they must have a database and all this on, but it is absolutely outstanding. And 9.5 million individual units of PPE dispatched, excluding F FFP3 masks, which are the ones that are fitted to you personally, because obviously there's another 1,100 of those <laughs> to throw in the mix. So absolutely wonderful, and thank you again um, to everybody involved. And then staffs themselves, that you know, our wonderful staff. We asked a lot of people to change jobs and do different things, things they've never done before. Um, you know, everything from we had some of our you know administration staff going and helping out on the wards. Uh, we had people coming into the ICC, as you know, people changing clinical area. In wave one, which was when we started, we had 27 staff redeployed. I think as, you, as we all know now, wave two was much more difficult to manage and we had 127 staff redeployed. So thank you to all of those people, the whole 154 people that were redeployed to different areas. Um, you know, without them being as flexible and, and being willing to change, we would have really, really struggled. So I am eternally grateful for that as well. 
Now, these are again a few more stats. So, the impact the pandemic had on our staffing requirements. So, we had an increased requirement of 6.28% staffing um, in terms of community nursing teams, 8.81% in terms of inpatient units. Um, 40, so, I'm reading this, so I don't get this wrong. 49,496 extra hours were required um, on top of normal staffing requirements. It resulted in 74,932 hours of temporary staffing requested, etc. So you can see on there a real shift in the requirements of staffing, significant numbers that we needed to try and work together to get filled. Um, and we you know we covered the gap with bank agency, people being redeployed, working extra hours. Everybody just threw their hat in the ring and did the really very best that we, that we could. So again, thank you for that. And we also did some new things in um last year in, that we'll, we'll, we will use going forward because this is also about learning going forward. So we've got uh, extra showers and toilets in porter cabins. I'm looking at Carolyn over there because we had lots of discussions about extra showers and toilets and porter cabins, but we did get there and staff did, we're very grateful did use them. We've got summer style uniforms now to cope with heat on the wards, clearly wearing PPE also exacerbates that, but going forward, um, you know, having those summer style uniforms is really great. Got new catering processes in, frozen meals for staff, washing machines, fridge freezers, microwaves, all different ways of working we had to provide equipment for. We've had a digital revolution through the pandemic. Pretty much everybody now um, uses Teams and we've, we've deployed numerous new bits of kit to, to facilitate and support that. And for those that know me, I probably, I'm now looking at Elliot, I probably was a bit of a Teams laggard and a bit of a scaredy cat when it comes to using Teams. He had to hold my hand a little bit, metaphorically, of course. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a Teams, you know, Teams warrior now, so, and we all are, aren't we really? But, you know, it's a bit silly to the pandemic in terms of what like me, Randy. You can't see him smiling at me, Sorry, <laughs> it's a bit difficult doing this virtually. And then, and, and also in the lockdown, we were grateful for help from our partners and their UEC Sports uh, really helped us with childcare, for example. There are numerous other um, other um, examples of working together as a system, and we were again very grateful for that. And we tried during the pandemic to continue showing our appreciation and recognition to you all. And I know again that has been difficult, and I know that not everybody's felt that we've done that as well as we could do and certainly we continue to try and learn. So we continued with the, the recognition, well we restarted the recognition um, scheme part way through I think towards the end of um, wave one into wave two of the pandemic and you know many of you have been doing amazing work and we've tried to re re recognise that. We did give everybody that worked through last year an extra day's annual leave this year and I hope some of you are able to take those extra days annual leave but I do know at the moment how difficult it is um, out there so I know it's tricky to take leave but please do try to do so. Um, we had a number of uh, wonderful donations um, and we were allowed uh, and charitable funds were very good to us and we had um, numerous refreshment boxes which we tried to change slightly through the year depending on feedback. Hopefully now as most staff have had access to their um, £20 high street voucher um, we did lots of comms, bite size training, podcasts, guides uh, as much as we could without it being overwhelming. We've got um, a dedicated wellbeing team that's worked during the pandemic um, and a wellbeing guardian. Um, charitable funds provided cooling towels during, during the hot summer months, which I know people found very, very um, useful. We've got benches and fresh air spaces that some of you will have seen around the, the different sites. Um, and we, we're really trying to support a really diverse network of staff at the moment. And I know we've got some questions about that later, but certainly we've got um, a Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic Staff Network established. And we've got staff ambassadors. And of course, underpinning all this, we've supported our staff through some fantastic work to ensure we've got access to the COVID um, vaccination programme early on. And now obviously we're looking forward in this year to the booster jabs as they start to come on stream in the next week's couple of weeks. So there was a lot there that went on in the last year. Um, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be the chief executive through this period, as well as, as, as you all know, be, you know, it's been hard work for all of us. But I just want to end by saying once again, a really big thank you to, to, to everybody, our patients, our staff, volunteers, and the people of Norfolk 
you know, we had some fantastic support from the people of Norfolk. I can remember on Easter Sunday standing just outside this room here with an under eight football team that wanted to give me my body weight in, in chocolate Easter eggs. Um, <laughs> and they, they brought all their Easter eggs in um, that they had been given um, and they wanted our staff to have them. And I think um, one or two people might have met their body weight in Easter eggs <laughs> after that. And that's just one example. We have the fruit and veg fan that used to come round at appropriate times so staff could get fruit and veg. We had all of those awful scenes in the media, didn't we, about um, frontline staff not being able to, to get out of work to go and, and shop because we had you know, panic buying in the shops and all those sorts of things. So we, you know, the people of Norfolk responded to us and we will be eternally grateful. I'm eternally grateful for the year um, that we had and how we've come through it. I know it's not over back. I know it's really difficult out there still, but you should all be proud of yourself. You're a credit to the organisation and 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 say I'm um, you know I'm proud to be the chief executive. So I will now hand you over to I'm sorry, Andrew, it's finance next, isn't it? <laughs> so Andrew Hopkins. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about finance. <laughs> I don't know why I'm sorry, really. <laughs> and you got to do with Right, so welcome everybody. I'm here to talk about finance, but I will first say, of course, um, that I've never seen a chief exec have so many numbers in a presentation before. So I feel almost dirty. Maybe I should let you do, do the finance as well. So, um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the financial performance of the trust during 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 the year of, that we just had. 2021 and also look a little bit forward as well to uh, the current year we're in and, 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 and beyond that. So the first thing to notice I think for our performance in 2021 is that we achieved a, a surplus of 0 .9, so just under £1 million pounds, which was similar to last year um, and it's, it's something that uh, NCHC has, has, has had a track record in meeting financial targets and performance. However, this was a very strange year because our original plan had been for us to be in a deficit position of one and a half million. But with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in, as just said, towards the end of March, we, uh, the NHS completely changed its financial um, regime um, and contracting rules and, and put in emergency arrangements for all organisations to ensure that enough resource went into the NHS um, to support trusts to be able to pay suppliers, to support trusts to be able to um, you know, put in place additional arrangements for, for meeting the pandemic and, and so on. And so um, the next the, the sort of boxes on this slide show the type of additional funding that we had in the year to help us manage. So we have an allocation of 4.4 million, which was specifically there to deal with COVID-19 costs. So the additional costs of providing services as a result of, of, of COVID-19. We also had funding to replace some lost NHS income, so things like staff car parking, for example, where um, you know, most, most organisations charge for car parking, it was recognised that we would not do that during the pandemic, and so some of that funding was then replaced centrally by, by NHS England. And also, we moved, every organisation was moved onto what we call a block contract, so rather than a payment per piece of activity or or you know, it's of operation, we, we, we all went onto a block contract where we, we received a set sum of money per month and we actually received that a month in advance of the month we would normally do, so more cash was pumped into the system. Um, and then on top of that, there were some top ups to, 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 to those block contracts. So a total of an additional sort of 10 million pounds or so of additional income. Um, because of all that, because of the changes in, 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 in costs, we saw our um, income, or income increase from 117.7 million, million to 128.5 million, but we had a corresponding increase in our expenditure of, of, of around 11 million pounds as well. So, um, so you can see the impact that the pandemic has had on, on, on us just simply in a financial sense there. Um, And as a result of that sort of pumping in the cash, and one of the reasons that cash was pumped into the NHS was uh, because a number of organisations in the NHS are in deficit and, and nobody wanted the money to be a reason why 
uh, uh, you know, services couldn't could, just couldn't be changed, couldn't be amended, new services couldn't be put in place to to to, to meet the needs of, of of the pandemic. And because cash was paid early, we saw a considerable increase in our cash levels from sort of 20 million up to so 26 million up to 36 million during during this period. Um, so the sort of more maybe the more boring aspects of, 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 of our performance. We, as I said, we maintained our surplus and we met our statutory duty to break even. So these are all sort of requirements generally of, of an NHS organisation. Those requirements didn't go away, but nonetheless, we still we, we you know we were still able to meet those. During the year, year we invested 5.2 million in capital projects, of which 1.3 million was was COVID related expenditure. So that included things like the laptops that, that Josie was referring to earlier, as well as putting in place welfare units or, or making space for additional beds on the wards and, and so on. Um, and during the year, um, while we, we, we suspended the efficiency programme, uh, you know, that, that was suspended right across the NHS in terms of, you know, it was really nice not to be able to have to talk about CIP, cost improvement programmes. Yeah, we didn't have to mention the sick word at all during, 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 during the last 18 months. Um, which, and, and I think interestingly, because of that, and because of the way we work with partners, but because money was never was not an issue with partners, uh, we made things happen much more quickly in the health service in our local system than we might have done when 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 money becomes the you know part of the problem. Um, and if I move on to the next, so just to um, again, this is the um, we every year we go through an a, 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 um, external audit of our of our annual accounts and our annual report. Um, once again, we received an unqualified audit opinion, which means that our auditors who are, who are KPMG consider the accounts give a, tr a fair and sorry a true and fair view of the financial performance and position of the trust. Um, and in terms of, they also do a value for money assessment of the organisation which looks at our financial sustainability, um, our governance arrangements and how we and how and our arrangements for sort of improving economy efficiency and effectiveness. And we received um, a totally green or you know, um, strong report on that with no weaknesses identified in those areas. So uh, this is this kind of builds this next slide builds on um, what, what Josie was was talking about in terms of some of the impact on the organisation. Um, so in terms of, as I said, the, the 4.4 million COVID allocation that we had um, supported additional spend on wards, on ward staffing, community response teams, discharge teams, discharge improvements, infection prevention and control, um, and, and um, putting in arrangements such as the the incident control centre and improving our wellbeing support. During the um, during the particularly during the, the first phase of the pandemic, so wave one, we we saw a we, we saw a very significant reduction in the level of activity that our services provided. Um, this was because uh, of not wanting to bring vulnerable patients into service. It was about people isolating. If some of our staff isolating. It was also about the redeployment of staff focusing on the clinical services that needed to be provided. But actually, during the year, and particularly in the first half of the year, we had a 20% reduction in the level of activity that our services would normally provide. And if you think about the NHS waiting list and the pressures that are on the NHS waiting list at the moment, in terms of the increased numbers, that would be our version of, of that NHS waiting list. Um, Josie's already mentioned that we, we, we opened that at any one time we had an additional 23 beds um, open. In total, we had actually made 38 beds available um, to, on various sites throughout the organisation, an 18% increase in our normal bed, bed stock. And this was very much around how we manage the uh, patients with COVID and patients without COVID and needing to keep them separate. So we had to create all that additional activity to make sure that we could manage those patients safely and in the right environment. We also um, saw um, you know, building on the digital revolution that, that, that the pandemic has sort of in, introduced in, into the NHS, our number of remote patient appointments rose during the year um, from, it, it was about 17.3%, so that includes things like telephone calls and video consultations. 
and, and at the height of the sort of, 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 of during the year, we increased from 17.3% of appointments being maybe virtual or remote to 31.8%. Um, with video appointments accounting for 5% of that, whereas they were a very, very small percentage of it previously. And I think one of the things that the whole of the NHS is now looking at is how do we build on those video appointments and make sure you know, you know, we, we use those appropriately going forward. So the, the investment in mobile working to support home working, Joseph's already also already mentioned, that was part of a capital spend of 1.2 million. And I, I think in total it was about 1,100 laptops that we bought during the year to, 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 to support that. Um, and also one of, one, of, one of the things that underpinned how we operated um, was, was we changed our governance arrangements during the year to ensure we had speedier decision making so that we could react more quickly um, to any issues that came up as a result of the pandemic. And one of, one of, and one of those was around uh, you know, one of our requirements that the NHS placed on us, uh, on the NHS, was because it was giving us all the extra funding, was to make sure that we continued to pay or perhaps speed up prompt payments of suppliers to make sure that key suppliers to the NHS didn't go out of business during, during the, the, the year. So I'll bring this on to, um, that's, that's sort of the, the look at last year. We'll bring this on to the current year that we're in. Um, then actually the, the COVID-19 financial regime has broadly continued in 21-22, um, although we will see some reductions in the second half of this year um, in, in our allocations, and that does introduce a, a, a small efficiency saving requirement back into the NHS. Um, however, from our point of view, we, we, we are, um, we, we are um, very sure that we, are, we, we will remain in surplus for, for the financial year. Um, and it will be a similar level, i.e. around a million pounds for that delivered this year. Um, also in the, in the current year, we, we've seen um, commitment from the government in, or from the Department of Health in the NHS allocations to increasing the level of spending community services. So there is an additional community development fund this year of five million pounds in the Norfolk and Waverley system, which, which the, the system is, is almost on agreement about how that will be spent. And for NCHC, that will see some additional roles and additional services coming into the trust particularly in relation to things like the ageing well two hour, two day wait um, and on additional discharge support as well. Um, as I said, the expectation is that the second half of this year, which starts uh, next week, next Friday, 1st of October, we will see our funding, the, the overall level of NHS funding reduced and, and an efficiency requirement of somewhere between 1.6 to 3 percent built into, into our, our allocations. However, the, the, the actual allocations themselves have, yet, have not yet been published by, by, by NHS England, so we don't yet know the full extent of that. However, there will still be funding on top of that for COVID support and so on, which is why we are confident of our position in year. Um, and we know that on the back of the pandemic, we are seeing, we, we will be able to sort of put forward significant savings in our travel budget, for example, because we have significantly reduced the amount of travelling that takes place in, 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 across our patch. Um, we will also continue to invest in, in, our, in, our, in our estate and in our, in our digital assets and in our clinical equipment as well, so 3.7 million for the year, which is the sort of size that we would normally um, be, be, be undertaking. And we will also expect to maintain our cash levels at the current rates. So um, I think the one thing we are then waiting for, as I said, we are waiting for the allocations for this second half of the year, and we are then also waiting for information on what will happen in 22, 23 and, 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 and beyond that, when, um, when the NHS is going to revert much more formally, or it will revert back to the more normal contracting and financial arrangement that we have. Um, but I think NCHC is in a very strong position to move forward on that and to uh, carry on delivering innovative uh, services to our population. So thank you. So I think it's now Carolyn. Thank you, Andrew. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Carolyn Fowler and I'm the Director of Nursing Quality. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of our quality account. Um, ben is going to join me in a little while, but we've got to do a little juggling act so that we get our masks in the right places and us in the right places. Um, so this quality account is really important, uh, probably more important than ever to tell our story of this year. And this is for our staff, our population and our patients. Um, and I think it's just worth remembering who's behind all that. When we talk about our staff, this year has been very much about all our staff, clinical, non-clinical, our corporate team, support teams, IT, finance, procurement, estates, our partners, uh, voluntary Norfolk, our students. I think it's important to make a really important point about our students who joined us from the University of East Anglia. They came at the hardest time and they joined us and they worked together with the challenges we had and we're very grateful to them. Also, our apprentices. Um, we have 135 apprentices at the moment in the Trust and uh, that's 6% of our workforce, which is amazing, much higher than uh, the public sector target that we're set. So I think it's really important that we celebrate us all in, as, as part of the Trust. So, um, well, I've got the move on. <laughs> so what's the quality account? It's us talking about that year and telling you about the quality. It's about the care that we've given, it's how safe we are, it's how effective we are, which venue's going to talk to us about, and it's also the experience that you have patients and the public have had of our services. Our services are many, as many people know, and there are lots of hidden services that I think we found in the pandemic. Um, some of our teams are out of hours that work in the evening on their own. Um, our triage teams working in, a, in an office with high skilled staff working out how to support our staff best. And things like our community access team and our high user, um, high intensity user teams. They don't always sit with us, but sit with our partners. And they're all part of the very rich teams that have delivered this year of quality. So there are a number of statistics there. Um, I'm like Josie, got a few statistics just to impress the finance director. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to pick one out in particular, and then I'll build on that as I talk in the next couple of slides. And it's the first one, the 93% of our staff reported that we encouraged uh, reporting of errors. And this is hugely important. And if you also see, that's the fifth year that we've improved. And I think as a board, that's one of our main vision is to create this culture where people are comfortable, confident, able to approach and say, this hasn't gone so well, this has gone wrong. It's also about a culture where you say where things have gone right and we reward people and we say thank you and we give feedback. And I think I saw more than ever during the pandemic, us saying thank you, us saying we did a good job, um, what can we do differently? Culture for me is about listening and sometimes during the pandemic and even now, actually listening is sometimes the only thing we can do. It's difficult out there. The other thing I think that goes towards our culture is kindness. And I think we saw that again through this year, the kindness not only to our patients, but to each other. One evening I remember talking to the Out of Hours team, um, they'd had a particularly difficult time. Um, they were going out on their own into the care homes and there wasn't much we could do to make things different. But what I did see was the way they supported each other the real team that they were and how they were looking out for each other. And I think that's what got them through um, an incredible theme staff. And there are many, 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 many others, as you know. So I think that's about the culture. And I just wanted to make a point about that because it is that culture which will make sure that we continue to learn and be a learning environment. And then the continuous improvement that we do will make sure our quality just get better and better. So patient safety, it's not just about us in MCHC, it's how we've worked together in the system. And we've done quite a lot of things internally and externally to improve our governance, our relationships and our leadership. One of those, uh, a couple of those examples around the system is the way that our um, infection prevention team worked in the pandemic. Went to outbreaks, 
um, not just to our own services, not just to care homes, but they went out to industry and made a real difference where we knew we could quickly stop the transmission of COVID. They had a tough time, as many of the teams did, but did an amazing job. The other thing we did, which I think Josie um, has talked about, is the vaccine programme. Early or late in the year we're talking about, early in this year, we started the vaccine programme. Not only did NCHC deliver to their staff, we delivered also to the population. We set up a mass vaccine site for people. We vaccinated our patients in our units. And also we're very proud of the roaming model that we started to develop at the end of this year. And now we're developing more. And this is a model where we go out harder to reach groups in the population, some that are homeless. Um, it might be at the moment we're actually out um, with the students supporting COVID vaccinating for those people just coming back into our universities. The really important system pieces of work that we did last year. Some of the things internally we did, which are really important, are some of the systems we set up. One of those was our clinical reference group, which actually now meets weekly still because we found it was so, so important. This enabled us to work at pace, uh, make decisions and have difficult conversations sometimes. And I just want to pick on one conversation that has been a thread throughout the whole of that year and continues to be, and one that personally I found probably one of the most difficult things, and that was on visiting. Visiting for our patients and their relatives was very, very hard, and we had to say no sometimes. But the way we did that is we did it as a team. So we met weekly with the ward managers to discuss it, and we made the decisions as a multi-professional group at the clinical reference group. We talked about the pros and the cons, the safety, the mitigation, the psychological impact, and had to make some very difficult decisions. But I'm really grateful for all the staff that day in, day out came and talked about what the problems were, so we could come to what we felt was the best decision. And I didn't have to make that decision on my own. I made it with everyone supporting us. So lots of teams work really hard. Safeguarding saw an increase in referrals and they were a very important part of the pandemic in that year. Um, they, but as they continue through that year, what the wonderful thing they did, like so many of the teams, is they continue to improve and develop what they did. So through that year, they developed a new programme of uh, safeguarding training that was virtual with a workbook. Absolutely brilliant. I've done it. Amazing. And people are scrambling to get on now to this training. So not only did they increase what they were doing, they constantly improved the quality of what they were delivering. And that's just one example of many areas where people really consistently improved and worked to do even better. Um, we recruited uh, Nick Bowman. So he is our freedom to speak up. Uh, guardian, such an important thing to do to have someone dedicated to that role, completely immersed in listening and taking care of those people that want to raise concerns. You can see we've had a number of uh, concerns raised and Nick now is really getting out to the teams, meeting them, understanding what the issues are. And if people put their hands up and say this isn't quite right, he's there listening and supporting. I'm going to move on now to uh, Venu, who's going to continue with the clinical effectiveness. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, thank you, Carolyn. And, and I wanted to say we have heard today the reflection of our NHS People's Promise at its best. We worked about how we work as a team, how we are flexible, how we are compassionate, inclusive and how we sense, send our gratitude to each other. But this is all about clinical effectiveness, isn't it? It's all about our learning, that continuous improvement journey that we have talked about today, whether it's in the corporate sector, that's the support service sector, or whether it's in the clinical world. And effectiveness in the clinical world is all about that continuous improvement through the understanding from research, whether it's the, the experiences of our colleagues and the patient preferences. So it's important to reflect back on these things while we look forward to another year of doing more or less the same things and continuously improving. So our huge gratitude goes out to our research team 
who have tirelessly worked in spite of the COVID pandemic to support the research internationally and, and support some of the urgent public health studies we really needed. And one of those important ones was the clinical characterization protocol, which was an international one, by the way. And those of you who've not had a look, uh, seen this one, please Google the clinical characterization protocol and you can see the efforts that have gone on internationally to support. Some of that studies have led to some of the innovations that we're seeing in managing the, the COVID pandemic. We've, uh, as a community trust, we have been sixth nationally in recruiting patients in spite of the COVID pandemic. And some, and, and some of this, not just in clinical things, but also understanding the mental health side of the COVID pandemic. And we have been involved in the psychological uh, study of uh, the effect of the COVID on, on, on the population. You can see that um, uh, we've uh, also continued to work closely with our, uh, with our local partners, which we've talked about uh, uh, quite a bit now, with our UEA, University of East Anglia, and we've got a health and social care partnership, and there are different working groups which we've all been participating in, and thank you to each of those colleagues who have been actively doing this. And we've also uh, are chairing the the Learning Difficulties Research Group of the, uh, the UEA, which will set us forward in our journey for the future of continuously improving things, continuously improving for our patients. So the next slide is all about how we have supported our staff to develop those skills to improve. And the Quality Champions Program is such an important part. Those of you who have not heard of that, please do go, you know, have a look on the internet for the Quality Champions Program and 124 staff have uh, being trained in the various skill sets you require, the knowledge, skills and attitudes required to provide that continuous improvement. And, and we as, a, uh, as an organisation have been supporting the system to develop the post-COVID rehabilitation service. And in spite of all the challenges of our workforce, our team have done wonders to try to provide support to our patients. And now our NH, uh, health and care staff uh, with, 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 with supporting them through living with the post-COVID syndrome. And, uh, and, and our individual staff members who have made team effort, have made changes to the management of diabetes and to our colleagues in the, uh, uh, in, in the Children's Justified Unit who have worked wonders to get feedback from our patients to understand what we can do differently. And, uh, and the last and final slide is to say what we are doing to support personalised care, and personalised care is all about understanding what matters to our patients. What, ma what matters to our patients. No one will understand what it feels like unless they have that experience themselves. So it's all about understanding what does the patient preference. What do they want, and how do we support them? And we have the care plan outcomes audit that's going on, and in supporting our staff as well in quality meetings in places, which is the new term for the localities where we have the quality team embedded, supporting them, supporting our colleagues to continuously improve everything that Carolyn and all of the team have been talking about. So now I'm not only thanking our, uh, uh, our, uh, our clinical teams, but also the support services teams. And you have heard from Josie and Andrew about how teams and support services have been continuously improving. Uh, the, the way we support our, our, our patient care and support our staff to enable that patient care. So once again, thank you all and I'll hand back to Carolyn. Thank you, Benny. So I'm just going to finish up with the third pillar of quality, which is patient experience. So we've looked at safety, clinical effectiveness, and patient experience, all equally as important. Um, this was very, very important this year, but what was great compared, you know, like other things we've been talking about, is we still develop things. So a new patient strategy was developed, um, our new quality teams that we also managed to place and uh, get, get functioning last year, um, helped to produce a patient strategy. We identified as a trust really before the pandemic started, we needed to do more. We needed to be looking more at our patient experience, more involvement and listening better. So we didn't let that go. We worked on that last year um, and we're now working to deliver that strategy and that includes more involvement. We're working with our partners, Health Watch, 
um, Voluntary Norfolk, Carers Matters, lots of external organisations that have been really, really supportive. And it's really exciting to see this system effect of really wanting to make a difference to the patient experience. We did lots of things. Um, we were creative, I hope, uh, and innovative during the, the pandemic around how we helped our patients. We did packs for them, um, drawing, painting, cards, all sorts of things to help them um, because they didn't have visitors. Uh, we even had little polarized Polaroid cameras. Do you remember those where you click the button, the picture comes out? If the nurse would agree, the patient would take a picture, and then we were sending letters back to loved ones saying, This is the nurse that's looking after me, or giving a little picture of their day. We also did, and we still do, um, send a letter to your loved one where you can go on the website and you can write a letter, and then that's printed off, put in an envelope, and given to a patient on the ward. So these were really important things for patient experience to keep people connected. It was a very difficult time for people. If you think we get used to now the masks, but it's actually still very difficult for our patients to have their care being given to people with masks on. Um, but we've, you know, we've done a lot to try and support that. I really believe that. And I just want to finish on the patient voice because at board, this is a hugely important thing to us as a board, that we listen directly to our patients or carers about the experiences they have. And we've had some amazing, amazing experiences. And I know sitting in the room, the board here that are here uh, would agree with me that have really made us think about what's important, what can we do differently, what can we do better. So uh, obviously we get uh, feedback and we're working really hard to look at different ways of doing that, looking at how we do that with our learning disability team. Um, and if you would like to feedback to, on the account, the quality account, you're very welcome, please do so. I would just say that the quality account is, is quite a few pages. It's a big, thick book, a bit thicker than this, but actually behind everything are you, the staff, Behind all those words are people and teams. It's really important that we take the time to look and see what other teams uh, and our staff have done. So um, I would like just to finish there. Uh, thank you very much. I hope what you will realise with the quality account that actually it's about a team. It's about a team effort. And I'm now going to hand over to, oh, there you go. I was nearly missed that. There you are. You can find our annual account um, and our report on the website. <laughs> um, and I am going to hand over, I think, I am definitely going to hand over to Andrew Williams, who's going to talk to you about our charitable fund. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, hello, I'm Andrew Williams, and uh, I'm a volunteer director, member of the board team, and I chair the charitable funds committee. Uh, I have a short presentation for you on the charity's work over 2021, uh, followed by a video about the Neuro Music Therapy Project, which the charity has supported. At this point, I'd also like to thank uh, Carol and Tracy uh, as the charity team in their first year, working together in steering, steering the charity through such difficult times. On this slide, there are some highlights for you. And uh, from that, you'll see that uh, we were able to support uh, 87 charitable requests, and we're always keen to receive more requests to cover more of our services, always looking to increase our reach across sites and services uh, of the trust. We spent just under £300,000, and our income in the year was £358,000. I'll say more on that in a moment. We're particularly grateful we saw 458 individual donations in the year and a significant step up in the gifts in kind, some of which Josie mentioned in her speech, which I think are really strong signs of how much the community appreciates uh, values, the work that staff have done in going over and beyond. That working in partnership is very much what enables the charity to do the work that we do do. Um, and uh, as you'll see, the overall size of the fund for uh, NCH and C charitable work is £922,000. 
that has been developed by working in partnership with all sorts of people, particularly um, groups like the Friends in our local hospitals, community groups, businesses, volunteers, and our own staff. And we've worked quite hard through the charity to raise awareness this year. There's a bit of a new logo and more communications going out to try and spread that reach. I'd like to ask on a big thanks, big vote of thanks to everybody who has supported us this year. In particular, we have received support from NHS Charities Together and one or two other partners. So in our income of the year, that £168,000 came mainly from NHS Charities Together, some from community donations. NHS Charities Together um, has funded the trust of £252,500 and that has enabled the trust uh, to support quite a wide range of projects. Um, alongside that, we particularly value the partnership with Unison, who stepped in and stepped up to provide funding alongside the charity to, for us to be able to provide the, uh, the food boxes, drinks, the towels, that were so important to start when they were so, so busy. I know that they still are so, so busy. Uh, but that was a, a, an important intervention um, and an excellent sign, I think, of Unison working alongside the charity. Starbucks get a mention here because they partnered with NHS Charities Together and their generous donation nationally built it its way through to our trust uh, and uh, it was uh, a donation of around about £2,000 to the work uh, that we were able to do to support during COVID. So that generous support also was complemented um, by an increase in, in staff themselves undertaking charitable fundraising activities um, uh, alongside the other activities taking place within the community. But we did understandably see quite a noticeable reduction in, uh, in, in exits over that period due to the restrictions COVID placed on families and what they were and weren't able to do. We continue to receive funding from NHS Charities Together uh, for us to be able to support uh, the, the next um, set of programmes to provide support to staff in terms of resilience. Uh, here we have some of the key achievements uh, covered in, in the annual report of the year. Um, it's very pleasing to say that we are now able to use the garden room at Deerham Hospital. It is now open for patients to use. Several of our projects were building projects and they were stalled, understandably, due to COVID. You'll hear more about the uh, Euro Music Therapy Programme in a moment. Uh, we also provided funding to support patients and their families stay in touch when contact was so, so difficult, as Carolyn has mentioned. And in that respect, we provided tablets which patients were able to use to have conversations uh, with their loved ones, mattering so much to them and their loved ones. We also provided um, a number of packs. So we provided um, patient entertainment packs to avoid isolation on the wards, uh, bereavement care packs, and also packs for uh, some of our people who we support with learning difficulties. Uh, and those were to deal with physiotherapy support and well-being support for them in such isolating times. Uh, less isolating was the encouragement to go outdoors. So we provided across a range of sites within the Trust, um, outdoor seating benches, which uh, I have myself seen, are quite well used uh, and uh, more comfortable than they've quite recently. <laughs> Looking forward, we continue to focus on our, on our three priorities, um, particularly supporting improvements in, in discrete locations, discrete services, whether they're community or inpatient. Um, we are always keen, as I've said, to extend our reach in terms of the support towards promoting the charity's objectives to secure benefits for patients. Also, we look for innovative, innovative projects which have the potential to work across the trust services and look to the proper governance uh, of our charity. We set out 
uh, on this slide some of the things that we hope to achieve over the next year. And in there you'll see there's, there's several of the projects which are now beginning to come back on stream, which are building related projects. Uh, and some of our more significant investments tend to be those projects. So uh, next year I'm hoping to report uh, on many more developments taking place uh, along those lines. Uh, we also uh, look to increase uh, our income to be able to do more charitable activities and are always interested in uh, engaging with those kind of fundraising activities and looking to see how we can develop ourselves and uh, supporting uh, projects such as to take the last one the delivery of the trust's dementia work following the audit taking place there my final slide uh, just puts up some quotes that uh, the charities received, which I think show really admirably the kind of feedback we've had from patients and carers and the appreciation that they have of the work of staff, which we're able to supplement by going above and beyond what the NHS itself can find by developing the range of character and activities in the trust. One of those is the Neuro Music Therapy Project that the charity has supported. I have a short video for you that uh, Carol has put together with the team at the Coleman Hospital and also uh, with the communications team. So I, I thank them for their efforts and we can move on. Community Health and Care Charitable Fund. Receives over 80% Norfolk Community Health and Care Charitable Fund receives over 80% of its income from legacies and in memory donations. In 2019, we received a generous legacy of £25,000 designated for use at Caroline House, our specialist neurological rehabilitation service. We worked with clinicians to research additional therapies that would benefit patients, but wasn't available on the NHS budget. Working with Chiltern Music Therapy, we agreed to fund a one-year pilot project of neuromusic therapy using the legacy and a further allocation from designated funding. Brain House provides brain injury rehabilitation for patients from across the east of England, and we've got 23 inpatient beds. So patients present with cognitive, communication, um, nutritional and physical challenges. Um, and those patients require specialist support from our multidisciplinary team. So music therapy was a strand of therapy that we weren't previously able to offer um, over an extended period of time. Patients are um, referred, um, having been initially assessed by the team, to our music therapist Kate. Um, and actually, when we're thinking about their, their physical needs, their communication and their cognition, music therapy in particular can be really beneficial to those patients. Music therapy is one of the 14 allied health professions and music therapists train um, up to master's level and then many of us go on to do um, specialised neuro music training or neurologic music therapy um, and this is an evidence-based approach. It's built on a really strong research base um, into how the brain and the body responds to music and it's very focused on improving in functional areas and rehabilitation. There's 20 standardised techniques um, that focus on areas of uh, movement, speech and cognition, um, as well as looking at emotional well-being. And as a music therapist, a lot of our grounding is in the more like psychological side. So uh, we also kind of bring that um, training with us as well. Um, when we listen to music, um, multiple parts of our brain are lit up at the same time. So parts to do with memory, speech, movement, emotions, um, and this increased activation can promote neuroplasticity and uh, forging new pathways and, you know, effectively mending um, and creating new pathways. Um, we can use this to regain and retrain elements of speech, so it might be initiation of speech, intelligibility, um, breath support, 
Um, we can focus on movement, so um, the fact that our bodies naturally entrain to rhythm can help us to regulate our movements, but also um, act as a distraction, allow us to go for longer. And then in the area of cognition, we might focus on attention. Uh, sometimes we look at neglect, um, using sounds to kind of bring someone's attention over to another side. Um, might use it for making decisions and uh, planning and um, executive functioning, all sorts of things. Um, so those are different areas that we might focus on. We also find that very often um, music therapy can be a way in to patients who aren't necessarily engaging with their rehab. So hey, quite often I get um, referrals to people who uh, they're just not engaging, but we maybe try doing their rehab in a musical way, adding some musical activities in, and they sometimes kind of perk up a bit more and are more interested. between November 2020 and uh, September 2021. I've seen 35 patients for music therapy on the ward. Um, some of those have attended the group, some of them, most of them have had one-to-ones as well. Um, one of the, well, I've had many sort of key moments really. Um, some patients have had a lot more focused work. One that was really notable, um, which we'll share a video of, video of um, was a patient who was referred uh, because he wasn't very engaged in physio sessions. Um, he was quite low in mood and uh, quite fatigued. And um, we found that when we introduced music, um, he really sort of came to life. He was much happier, kind of uh, much more motivated and really joined in a lot more. So, um, and he just knew all the words to everything. He'd just sing along. Um, so we tried standing without music. The patient was sort of practicing standing and sitting balance. Um, we practiced standing without the music, managed it for three minutes. Then we did standing with the music and he did it for eight minutes. Uh, this is within the same session. And then he sat without music comfortably for about 10 minutes on his own. And then after that, um, sort of 30 plus, the, the physio kind of said he could go forever really. So when he had the music, he was just kind of distracted from the difficulty of the physio really and just was um, kind of a lot more engaged and able to do it and um, more motivated. The pandemic has posed some challenges. Um, firstly, when I first started, the patients weren't really allowed out of their rooms. Um, so we weren't allowed to mix or to have a group in person. And one of the things I did um, quite quickly on um, IT were really helpful and helped us to set up lots of iPads and use a Zoom account. And I started to run a music group online but within the ward. So all the patients, well, five or six patients had an iPad in their room. Um, and then I would go in an office um, and lead the session with a laptop and with my piano and my guitar and sing and lead some songs and the patients really loved that. They loved being able to see other patients on the screen um, and we, it was quite heavily staffed. We had to have a number of staff with each patient to kind of work the iPad and um, take some instruments in and, work, and you know, be there with them, but um, it was really, really worth it. Um, the other thing that I guess has made it tricky is uh, the PPE, like the amount of PPE, trying to play a guitar with gloves on, um, those sorts of things. And there's a lot of concern about singing and stuff to start with. So I had to be really careful, things like opening windows, um, you know, keeping distance, just being really, really careful with stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of extra risk assessment, which I'm sure everyone's used to. Patients have benefited greatly from having access to music therapy. Music therapy has this ability to encapsulate all therapy, so speech, occupational, physical and psychological. 
patients are able to participate in rehab without actually having to think about the functional tasks that they're doing within music is linked to their rehab. Staff report that the musical interaction has an impact on patients' willingness to participate and a positive impact on their mood, fatigue and general outcomes. Patients report music therapy to be really enjoyable and they say that the music therapy makes rehab more interesting. And music therapy ultimately brings such a sense of cheer to the ward, has such a positive impact on both staff morale and patient well-being. We're delighted with how the project has been received, particularly during such challenging circumstances. After the one year pilot project is complete, we hope to secure longer term funding so that our patients can continue to benefit from this amazing service. enjoyed that really wonderful film about the impact of music therapy on some of our patients. I know it's uh, something that we've been looking at as a trust for a little while now. Um, I think my memory does serve me correctly that we had a presentation at board probably a couple of years ago actually, um, prior to obviously the, the work that you've just been showing today. Absolutely uh, fantastic, um, fantastic um, um, service um, and you've obviously seen firsthand on the screen the impact it's having on our patients. So we are really very grateful to the Charitable Trust um, funds for, for being able to support it and thank you to the staff that obviously work with it and work with the patients. Um, we're now going to move on and I'm sorry the other thing I was just going to say is I don't know how much you can hear from here but we've had a motorbike going outside, we've had a big delivery lorry, um, I'm not sure whether you heard that during the film, I hope it didn't detract if you did, you may not have heard it at all, you've got no idea what I'm talking about and if that's the case that's great, <laughs> we certainly could hear it in here. So we're now going to move on to what we normally have is, is a member of staff coming to present. We've had Queen's nurses in the past and various other people coming to present. It's usually a really well um, received session, but because of the restriction on numbers in the room that we can have this year, we've had to do a, a short video. This video shows you a whole range of things that have been going on during the pandemic. Everybody today has mentioned that everybody within this organisation in every single role has contributed to, to how we've supported and worked together through this really tricky time. So I, I hope you enjoy it. We're then going to move on to a question and answer session. And um, so I'll leave you with a video and speak to you again shortly. I think it's about three or four minutes long. Thank you. When did I realise the pandemic was coming to us? Um, probably around December 2019. We knew it was respiratory. We knew the PPE we would need. We don't routinely stock it. I just had a feeling this was coming to us. <laughs> And it started to happen around us. It, it wasn't really affecting us. The pods to test went to the acutes and it wasn't coming anywhere near us at that point until February, the skiing trip to Italy in half term for the children. And we were called in probably about lunchtime to a meeting with a lot of providers, the CCG, and we were asked to start screening these children that day because the acutes couldn't cope with it. We were expecting somewhere between three and 500 children into Norfolk. We came away from that meeting and within about four hours, with the help of estates procurement, Carolyn, we'd set up a drive-through screening service here on site at NCH. I remember very clearly the rumbles of the pandemic beginning. I used to be at staff induction every Tuesday. And I remember for the first time, we just slightly spread out the chairs for once 
little did we know what was about to happen. I remember coming away from that induction, seeing my manager back at the base and her asking me to go home. I remember saying to her, I just needed to grab my physio uniform, which I've always had hung up beside me in the office in case I was ever needed to go onto the front line. I remember grabbing that, a couple of boxes of kit, emptying my drawers and returning home. And there I sat waiting for further instructions. How did it feel that day? Um, it was a bit scary because it is the unknown. I knew the team that I was putting out there that night to do this was as prepared as they could be. They were as protected with their PPE as they could possibly be. Um, and it, it, it has to be done and that's what we're here for. For me, um, during the pandemic, it was such a difficult um, scenario to be in, especially at the beginning, because nobody knew really about the virus or how risky it is. We were risking our lives and our family's lives, bringing it home to our family, our children. Um, but then I think in the back of our mind, we need to remember we're here to support these patients who may have the virus um, and to care for them the best we can, uh, wearing all our PPE, so keeping us as safe as possible. Like at the time, putting all the PPE on and we're putting the masks, the visors, the big gowns, we weren't used to doing that and it was scary. But I think my main priority is we've got to, like, we've got to do it. Like we're nurses, we're in healthcare, we're looking after patients at this tough time. Yes, things were difficult very early on. There were some difficult conversations where, you know, I remember standing in this in this particular room with with some order sheets, people requesting 20 boxes of gloves, and I've got five on the shelf. It was pretty intense. Not everybody knew what procurement was or what we did. Um, so to be under the microscope that quickly was was a massive change for us. But it uh, it, it really galvanised the team. We sat down very early on and talked through what was going to happen and the role that we were going to be playing. And everybody bought into the, the ethos that we wanted to do everything we could to help the, the frontline staff who were going through a more difficult time than, than we were. So I think there were a lot of our corporate staff within NCHNC who really just wanted to help. They were aware how their frontline colleagues would have been feeling and wanted to do all they could. So I know so many people volunteered to do lots of things outside of their normal roles. So I think another big thank you needs to go out to all of those who changed their job roles beyond recognition and came to support their colleagues in other services. At the beginning of the pandemic, everything changed for our team and um, we weren't doing face-to-face -face visits and um, we weren't seeing people in school schools weren't letting us go in obviously and a lot of schools were shut so all of our meetings within our team became virtual and a lot of our um, appointments with people became virtual as well so you know setting up in your own house working from home having those difficult conversations in your own home as well made it, it was just massively different I mean, luckily the trust was really invested in helping everybody um, be able to access work to work from home. So within the team, we came up with lots of different ideas how to support our families, just using the platforms that were available to us and social media. So we have a Starfish Twitter page, um, which we didn't really kind of utilise it as much until kind of COVID and things, you know, asking them to send any queries in that they had for us that we could maybe follow it up then and there um, and just trying to I think any helpful things that we would find that we would share that with our families and that would also um, coincide with the starfish wave. We invented the starfish wave um, which is um, a newsletter that goes out monthly so extra support for families to feel like you know they were still in our minds and they were still being held during the pandemic, we had to work really differently. Uh, we went completely virtual to start with. We have been doing video calls, telephone assessment, showing exercises to patients on the telephone call, assessing their back, knee, ankle, adjusting the cameras many times while showing my patient how to move their ankle or how to move their back. It is difficult, but we, I'm, I'm hopeful and quite positive we will get through this together. During the pandemic, there was so much pressures on the IT for the fact that uh, many people could not come to the office due to the government guidelines. So we, being the IT department, we need to continue to give support, technical support to people. So we had to go to different sites. 
irrespective of the pandemic. So that it kind of put pressures on us. We have to double up our job, but in a way we still got over it because we know we have to just deal with it and help people. We are resilient, we are flexible. So as a trust, we think ahead. We started having conversations that we wouldn't have had before. And people looked at it as a joined up service rather than lots of little independent services. You know, if we had a particularly quiet day and, and knew that our colleagues at the North of Norwich were under pressure, we swapped stock, we were passing things around the system. We hadn't done it before. Everyone had operated in their own silos and, and all of a sudden we were making decisions based as a system. And, and we've kept those strong relationships and, and maintained those conversations. It's really great to be able to, you know, know that we're doing a bit more than what we were with with the new the new modern world and the way that we're doing things. The last 18 months for a lot of staff have been a complete whirlwind and lots of staff have just been on what can only be described as a hamster wheel or a treadmill and they've just keep running and they have not yet stopped. Yes, lots of restrictions might be lifting, but in the NHS they really haven't. PPE still continues. We are still continuing to have to lateral flow multiple times a week. We're still being caught by isolation rules, of course, and we are adhering to those obviously that is causing problems in terms of staffing across the board but everyone continues to support one another it is extremely hard out there at the moment in the NHS our waiting lists are an all-time high um, and those in our care also have got more needs than they ever did before but what I can't fault is the kind and caring and compassionate nature of every single member of team that I come across who is continually every day to do their best Initially, we probably underestimated the effect this was going to have on the staff, and I, and I don't think we're unusual in that. You hear talks of PTSD and the trauma, um, and I can see that in some of my own team. I honestly don't know how they kept going, and some of them did break, um, and they needed time off. And I am hugely proud of the team. They have bent over backwards they have gone over and beyond and back again when they weren't in the best places themselves. We have set up some phenomenal initiatives that haven't been seen anywhere before and I hope we don't lose that. And they come about because other people in the trust bend over backwards to help us. You know, so estates, IT, procurement, nothing we asked for was too much trouble from anybody. It was a very, very scary time. And I think that taught me to be kind to myself when I'm working as well. That I don't have to know all the answers. I don't have to be able to solve everything for everybody. And it's about being kind to yourself because if you're kind to yourself, you can be more for other people. Going forward from the pandemic, I make sure to check up on my colleagues a lot more. Make sure everyone's sort of comfortable and not overworking themselves. And really just try and band together because that's all we've got <laughs> when we're out there on the ward. You just need to rely on each other and really support each other as much as you can and try and hold your head up high, I suppose. Thank you very much um, to everybody that put the, both of the films together. They're really quite emotional to watch, uh, bring back memories, things we've forgotten during the pandemic as well. And I do remember um, Beth at the beginning, very beginning, mentioned the ch young children coming back from, um, I think it was an Italian skiing trip. It was actually a board day. We were in this very room in board mode. Um, and we'd also got up from the CQC with as well, which was always a bonus. Um, and uh, this whole thing started to, to, to um, evolve during that day. And to be honest with you, when they said to me we're going to have a drive through um, swapping centre, I thought they were pulling my leg. <laughs> we were talking in McDonald's style, but clearly that's what we, we needed to do. That was the model that was the most efficient, effective and safe. And we used that model in a number of places across the Trust and nationally. You've seen the sort of drive through arrangements on the television as well. So that was the first for us. But as Beth said on the video, we, we kind of, you know, 
we as a rule, we, they got, got very quickly got their heads around it, worked out what needs to be done, and we were up and running in no time. So, yeah, that probably was the start of what you could actually see in NCHC in terms of the pandemic. Anyway, we're now going to move on to um, the question and answer session. We are um, a little bit ahead of time, actually, um, so we've got plenty of time for questions. In the room with me, obviously, there's the presenters that you've already seen. Um, I'm hoping, and now I'm looking at um, Miranda and Elliot, that online we've got the rest of the executive director team and non-exec team. So um, I haven't got to answer all the questions on my own, which is good. Um, so what we'll do is similar, you know, many of you will be used to ask the chief exec on a Wednesday, very similar to the ask the chief exec that style um, and Miranda will pick the questions up off the um, system and um, ask them directly to me and our field um, to if I don't answer it I'll field it to others that may have a better understanding of the issue than I do. So we'll make a start shall we Miranda? Yes we will and um, so the first question is an anonymous question uh, with conversations about EDI so equality diversity and inclusion and now having a new EDI advisor in post yeah. what does allyship mean to you individually and for the trust as a whole? And, and thank you um, whoever the anonymous person is that posed that because this is a really really important area that I think over the coming months and years we are going to see much more activity around within the trust um, and um, certainly um, it was a question that we, I think we had it posted ahead of time, didn't we? So I have, um, I'll, I'll start to, to give a little bit of a feel for that, but it also John Webster, I believe, is on uh, on the line, as they say, and I'll bring John in in a second. I think the question was about me personally, wasn't it, first? So I guess um, supporting equality, diversity, inclusion, and we've really, you know, had have a focus in the region and um, in the system here around um, race. We've got, we're, we've got an anti race and strategy regionally that's been devolved down to the trust. We've all been pulling together our anti-racism pledges and we've got that going out to the broader organisation, I think, pretty soon, Miranda, if it's not already gone out. But for me, it's a really key issue. So allyship was the term, I think, that the, the questioner asked. And allyship is trying to support people that, are, that have had a different lived experience than you. So I'm a white woman. You, you see me as chief executive. You don't really know anything about my background where I've come from, the, the issues that I've faced, my equality, diversity and inclusion points. And it's equally the same for people that from a different background, you don't know necessarily what's, what's happened to them. Me, for me personally, I think it's important that we start to pay attention to these issues. I think it's really important that we try to have a, a culture where we are listening as much as we're speaking, that we try and use the appropriate language. And I know I don't always get that right, but I think there's a bit of a humility in allyship about if you've not got it right or you've, um, you know, it's called hopefully never cause any offence. But if you haven't quite got it right, be prepared to learn from that and prepare to develop, obviously, um, you know, the policies, procedures in the organisation that underpin um, that equality, diversion, include diversity, sorry, inclusion uh, approach across all of the protected characteristics. This year, the region is, is focusing on race. Other years, it may be other uh, protected characteristics, but certainly the underlying principles about um, trying to see things from the other person's perspective, listening, learning, um, being open, encouraging a broad range of opinions uh, underpins all of those um, allyship across all of those protected characteristics from, from my perspective. I don't know, John, whether you can hear me or whether you're there, because John is our um, Equality and Diversity Inclusion Director Lead, and whether John would like to add anything to that. Ah, I can see him on a screen. Hello, John. Hi, morning, Josie. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I fully agree with everything you said there, Josie, and I think for me, I think it, it for, I firmly believe it starts with us as individuals. Um, it's about listening, but it's active listening. It's not just hearing what someone has to say and trying to understand those different perspectives. And importantly for me, it's about not assuming that we know. And, and actually, uh, I chair the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Group, um, which is going to be our means for promoting allyship across the organisation. Um, we meet um, every two months. Um, and, and what I'm trying to move us away from is necessarily looking at lots of data on how we're performing around EDI and opening it up much more developmentally to think about how we can influence the way we um, approach allyship in the organisation. 
um, it is very much early days, but but I think the commitment ties us back to the very first sort of opening marks that, remarks that Geraldine made around the trust values, and it's the values of this trust that will drive our approach to allyship. I strongly believe the vehicle for doing that is our EDI group. Um, we've also benefited from some external support. So you, you mentioned Mercy, who's in place as our EDI advisor. Uh, but we also had Anika Patrick Redhead from the Royal Papworth Trust came to one of our meetings back in June, I think it was. Um, she gave some presentations to us and, and it was a really thought provoking session. Um, and we're using the output of um, her presentation to develop some practical actions in relation to allyship, which we'll be able to share with the trust in the coming months. Um, so can I hand back to you, Josie, if that's OK? Thank you, John. Thanks very much indeed. And, and uh, thank you, as I say, for, the, for whoever posed the question. So, Miranda, I'm sure we've got a few more, so um, shall we continue? There are lots of questions coming in. The next question is, is there any update on the Norwich Community Hospital site development? Right, I probably should hand over to Andrew. Um, I'm not sure if I move over, Andrew, out of your way. Does that work? You can. Um, so this was a question that was asked, I think, on uh, Chief Exec's Q&A a few weeks ago. Um, we have, and at that time there was no um, no new sort of uh, word on where or update on where we were going with this site. However, we have um, subsequently to that we've been asked to, uh, or all the NHS has been asked to put in um, bids for a new hospital or developing existing sites. Um, so we've registered an interest on that for this site, and we are also having discussions with our partners around possible um, new developments or new new services that maybe that could be that this site could be utilized for in particular where we've cleared the buildings in, in previous years so it's very early days in that process but we have registered an interest in, in, in sort of seeing this site developed um, maybe not quite along the lines of what we had previously looked at three or four years ago but certainly something that would see more services on the site Thank you, Andrew. Can you still see me if I stand this slide? Yes. So, Miranda, I think we have uh, another question. Next question. It's Black History Month next month. How do you plan to celebrate and do you celebrate any cultural event personally? What are they and what do you do? <laughs> right, I'm going to walk back over here because I don't want to get Black History Month wrong because, again, we had a little bit early heads up on this one, didn't we? So, so yes, as a trust, we are going to be celebrating Black History Month. Um, and there's a whole, and the reason I need the glasses is because there's, there's an absolute whole itinerary um, right through October of all sorts of things going on. So each week has a theme. Um, so the first week of October is going to be Black History Month proud to be. Then we've got health and wellbeing. We've got some international recruitment going on as well um, that, that um, we want to share with people. And uh, the week, so that's week three. And then week four is community. So on Ask the Chief Executive this week on Wednesday, if any of you did listen in or, or, or are planning to listen in uh, on Friday, we, we talked um, a lot about um, a session on 28, which I think is next Wednesday, when we're celebrating um, members of uh, staff joining us through the international recruitment and we're celebrating West African culture on that day. And I um, will be here on site that day, so I'll be very much looking forward to joining people um, on that. 4th of October, we've got Race Ahead, which is an NHS big conversation about race, and we'll be uh, involved in that. Um, and we've got a video to introduce Black History Month. And then the list goes on, really, virtual coffee mornings, um, certainly looking after you too, which is an inclusive events, race equality matters, etc, etc, right through until the end of the month. So we've got a lot going on around Black History Month and I know our brilliant comms team here will make sure everybody um, knows what's going on and, and can participate um, in, in those events should they wish to. But that question had a couple of other things about what things do I celebrate, I think, me personally. OK, um, so it, it's it's equality, diversity, inclusion, as I say, protected characteristics, the things that I celebrate, um, you may or may not know about me. So my daughter is gay. I celebrate pride and all the things that go with that. She, I think my daughter knows every single gay person in the whole of the UK. She's got such a wide group of friends. Um, so I'm you know, really sort of quite tuned in to, to that sort of thing. Um, I'm not particularly religious, so I don't really obviously do Christmas and that sort of thing like everybody else does. But maybe I'll ask the panel if um, they've got anything. Or maybe they're all, looking, they're all glaring at me now like, please don't ask me. Geraldine, what, 
St. Patrick's Day. Oh, St. Patrick's Day. Yes. <laughs> I'll borrow Miranda's dress. Yeah, you can't see Miranda. She's got beautiful emerald green dress on at the moment. So, so yes, there's a whole range of things I think that we probably all celebrate. Whether we consciously think of them in the context of the question, I don't know, but we do do celebrate and proud to do so. Okay, okay Miranda, have we got another? The next question is, what do the execs think the future will look like at NCHC in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic? i.e. the impact on our ways of working, mask wearing and how we deliver our services. Yes. Uh, and that's a really good question and I think it's something that's on everybody's mind at the moment um, in terms of what is the world going to look like. Um, will we ever go back to how we were? And I guess we all know really the answer to that now. The short answer is that we probably won't. Um, although we are seeing obviously um, our day to day life um, moving along and with less restrictions. So again, I'll, I'll make a start on this. We've got a new ways of working um, group again that John chair, so I'll come on to that in a second, but also I'll ask Pat Venu and Carolyn to, to give a bit of a clinical perspective. So, so we need to find a balance, don't we, as an organisation, I think, moving forward in terms of how we're working at the moment. I know many of you are coming back into the office, but many of you are also still working from home. And I guess um, what we'll end up with is probably some sort of hybrid approach. What we need to make sure we do um, in terms of how we go about this is we've got to balance the need of obviously safety and making sure people are COVID safe but also making sure that our staff aren't isolated and ensure we can deliver the full range of services to the best policy we possibly can. So there's a kind of balancing act going on between safety at one end, home working, making sure people are, are, are fit, still feel part of the organisation, the team and are supported and the best quality services be that clinical or support services that we, we have to achieve. And I know John chairing the group is not far off, I think the group making, um, talking to the staff our staff about where we are and what that might need to look like in the future. So, John, I don't know whether you want to come in on that. Uh, yeah, thanks, Josie. And I think we're, we're looking to announce stuff more generally to, to staff over the next fortnight or so. Um, I'm taking some recommendations to our executive team next Wednesday. Um, and I think the, the straight answer to the question, I think Josie's given it, 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 it is going to result in some form of hybrid working as we go forward. Um, we've been clear throughout the process of the project group that this is about balancing the needs of the individual with the needs of, of the trust and its business. Um, and the recommendations that we form will be um, over time and phased. And, and we, we all know that COVID is still very much out in the community at the moment. Um, there will not be a rush to return everyone back to office or indeed some clinical areas. Um, and just to give you an example, someone, a member of staff contacted me um, a couple of weeks ago now and, and we had a conversation together um, because she was really anxious about being instructed to return to the office. Um, she has some health conditions herself that she is managing um, and is working effectively from home. And I was able to give her some reassurance, I think, that, you know, we are not going to come out in a couple of weeks time and announce everyone return to where you were before. Um, and the guiding principle for us has always been around or principles around following the guidance that's issued to us and making sure that our staff are safe. Um, so very much in that vein and, and, and more to say on that in the coming weeks, Josie. Thank you, John. And then, Helen, do you want to just come and make some few, few comments? Yes, thank you. I was just going to pick up on the mask uh, wearing part of that and also the clinical side of infection prevention, because nationally there is a draft out for new guidance. Um, and uh, although it's not published yet, I think what I can say is that mask wearing will be here with us for quite a long time. Um, and partly due, as we've just been saying, transmission is still there and it's still high. Um, they will be looking at things like the social distancing, the, 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 uh, the one, two metres possibly, but just remember in the NHS, we're going to be doing, the, we are going to be um, very adverse to taking risk. Um, I think the other thing that we will need to look at is how we manage COVID as our, one of our normal respiratory conditions like flu, because at the moment we have problems with flow, managing beds because we have to cohort. So I think that will be something that we might see changing as things become a little bit more normal. But for the time being, well, as far as I can see, we will be wearing masks. Um, and I know NTHC, we are very keen to have very strict guidance because we know it makes a difference. 
about keeping not only our patients safe, but keeping us all safe too. Thank you, Karen. Right, Miranda, I'm sure we've got a few more. The next question is, how will moving to an ICS change how community services deliver care? Right, okay. Is it the hard question week this week? <laughs> so I, I guess for me, moving to an ICS, we've, we, ever since I've been with NCHC uh, for the last three, just over three years, we've always been looking at the system. So pre-ICS, we have the SDP, um, and we've always worked as part of a system approach to providing the best possible health and social care um, that we can, looking after you locally, is to go right back to where Geraldine started. I think what the focus is going to be in the future around community care, and Andrew mentioned the Community Development Fund, for example. So, you know, we would say in community, at, at last, we've got a focus on community care. If you go right back to the NHS plan, which was published pre-pandemic, January 2019, there were a number of challenges for community around improved uh, the improved range of services outside of hospitals. We've already seen the Aging Well programme. We were a, a pilot site, an early implementer of Aging Well, the two-hour response and two-day response. So we are having the real focus moving forward as part of the system work that we've all we done on what can we do to improve our offer from a community perspective to the range of patients that we want to support. Now clearly we don't do that alone, we do that working with social care and as you know, um, you know through Laura, Laura's post we've got a We've already got a management level of integration agreement about how we join together with social care and deliver services in an integrated way. I think we'll see more integration with our primary care networks. We mentioned earlier on we've got Joe Parks who's joined us from primary care to help us get a better insight into terms of how we might work better together in partnership. And then obviously our mental health colleagues and there's, a, there's probably a lot of um, possibilities there. And then broadly, Carolyn's already mentioned voluntary sector, how we work with the volunteers, voluntary action Norfolk, Sector. So lots of examples of how we already work together. I think that will be built on through the ICS in, 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 in the coming years. Um, and I think we need to embrace um, moving towards an ICS and see that part as part of the strategic development of the organisation and part of our continual improvement journey in terms of all uh, of delivering the best possible range of services that we can in a community setting. Um, and there's one or two service developments that will come online later in the year that you may have already heard about. So we already we have had in the past um, services like intravenous drugs being given in the community. That's being re-looked at. Can we develop that further? And, and, and can we develop it for a broader range of patients? We are looking at discharge to assess, patients being discharged far earlier, so needing more therapy in the community. We're working with our acute colleagues to get that resource out into the community. So there's such a lot going on already, um, and I think that will be how we work moving forward post the pandemic, and certainly the ICS becoming a formal statutory body next April um, formalises what's been really partnerships in the up till now about us all wanting to do it for the right reasons. But I don't know whether Laura's on the line because Laura might have some more to she wants to say about integrated services. Laura, are you there? Thank, thanks, Josie. Yes, and uh, I think the um, ICS is just really a, a formality, as you say, of things that we've already done over the years, and we're probably a little bit more forward thinking having been in an integrated structure for several years now. But we're really looking now more at working with our um you know our, our colleagues in social care and our services that serve the same people such as the ot's in social care working much more closely with the acute ot's and the community ot's and norfolk first support working to help us on the discharge pathway and the two hour and two day um target so i think you've i think you've covered it all really josie but i think we are in a good position going forward um because of the work that we're already doing Thank you, Laura. Sorry, Laura, you're not stealing the thunder. I apologise. <laughs> no, that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> lots to do, though. And, it, and you know, it, it's going to be both an exciting and challenging time, I think, moving into the LCS. So, Miranda, do we have any more? We do. The next question says, I just wanted to say that it's been wonderful to have Josie as our CEO for the past three years. You will be missed. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the new CEO announced at yesterday's Ask the CEO session? Yeah, and it probably shouldn't be me that tells you a little bit more about the new CEO. I don't know whether Jeremy, whether you, thank you for those kind words, I suppose I ought to say it. I shall miss you all too. It's going to be, it's three weeks today is my last day. So it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster, uh, try and keep it all together. But uh, 
Geraldine, before we see the Chief Executive, do you want to say a few words, Geraldine? I'll answer that when I stand up. I can yeah. do that. Geraldine, yeah. then do that at the end. So we'll hold that one. I'll, I'll leave back five minutes at the end and Geraldine can yeah. for that. Okay. okay. The next question is, are there any plans to increase the number of frontline clinical staff? Yes, in the short yes, in short there is, but maybe I'll ask if Laura's still there. Laura has been leading um, a massive recruitment drive um, across the system. Um, perhaps Laura can come in and answer that. It's got much more detail than me. Laura. Thanks, Josie. Yes, um, as you say, we've got a big recruitment drive across the system, and that's really focusing on new roles um, that we can get in. We know that uh, we are short in short nationally of senior registered staff. So whilst we continue to recruit those, we're looking at other sort of projects as well. There's also, as Andrew mentioned, um, been the community development funding that we've got. So we've got the opportunity to increase staff in there. And a couple of the um, schemes that are in that project for that um, money are continuing funding the posts that we've had over the last 18 months or so through Aging Well. And that's to help with our two hour and two day um, targets to, for admission avoidance and reablement. Um, some levelling up monies, so some localities that haven't been funded to an equal level in the past will be getting more staff. And then we have a big recruitment drive on for band threes and fours to help those teams in admission avoidance and supported discharge from hospital. We've been interviewing for those this week. We've we recruited three people last week and we've interviewed a further 19 this week. So um, those interviews finish today and that, in, that advert will stay live until we get up to our full cohort of people. So very positive and, and getting some really, you know, really exciting new blood into the service as well through those roles, which I hope then, you know, in the spirit of growing our own, as we've been very good at in the past, that some of those people will go on to, um, you know, further roles to, to train as a nurse or a therapist and stay with us in the future. So lots of exciting work going on around recruitment. Thank you, Laura. And also just reminded me of you speaking that Carolyn mentioned earlier on a number of apprentices that we've got. Again, we'd like to think our apprentices will then move on to a career in, in the NHS. Um, going forward as well. So yes, lots going on. Um, and you know, it, this this is all about trying to balance, trying to get things read, you know, the recruitment, the ICS, etc. alongside obviously what we know is really quite a pressured time from a um, demands on our clinical services. So I know a lot of people are working really, really hard to make all of this happen, uh, all in tandem really. So thank you, Laura, for that. Miranda, do we have any more? We do. The next question is will staff continue to be allowed to work from home? I think we've sort of touched on that with John's answer. So um, if, if that person can can perhaps keep an eye on the comms, um, if, if this hybrid is probably what we're going to be looking at, but how that, what that means for you, I think it'll be much more of a local conversation. So I think we've, we've covered that. But uh, And again, if any of the things today you don't think we cover enough, then we've got to ask the Chief Exec next Wednesday, bring it back, we'll have a, another look at it. The next question is, are you confident that our new CEO will be a strong advocate for community health care in the ICS? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we might be able to touch on that yeah, at, yeah. at the end, but certainly well, I, I, I wasn't involved in the recruitment, obviously I wouldn't be, but I know that the recruitment process had that underpinning our values and focus for community, etc. Um, was, was, was one of the key themes. Um, the next question is, are there any plans to work more with the voluntary sector? I'm sure that Carolyn probably might be best to place to talk about that. We do a lot with the voluntary sector, as Carolyn touched on in, a, in the quality account. Maybe, Carolyn, if you'd like to give a bit of detail. Uh, short answer is yes. Um, we're always trying to think of new things and be creative um, with ideas for the voluntary sector. Um, it's been a difficult time for the voluntary sector at the beginning with the pandemic. Many of their volunteers couldn't work, but they're all back now working. There are lots of exciting um, projects going on. They've obviously been helping us with the vaccine centre. One of the things they're doing is a system supporting discharge. So some of the patients that are going home, the voluntary service, uh, voluntary Norfolk are supporting discharge for those patients. And we're going to be looking at that at NCHC. So there are lots of things. Anyone has any ideas, we're always really welcome to them. Uh, voluntary Norfolk is very creative and is looking at ways to do things differently to support the system. So ideas are always great and received. Thank you. We've probably got time for maybe one or two more. And I know Geraldine wants to say a few words and probably close. Yeah. yeah. Okay, another question. What is the Trust doing about sustainability and environmental issues? 
Right, okay. Um, I think that's another John question, really. Um, we've just, uh, well, while, we've, while we let John come in, the NHS has, has re-pledged, really, in the last few weeks about the Green Agenda. Um, and we are, you know, that now is another piece of work that's starting to, to get a bit of momentum. But John, I know we've just um, re-looked at how we're going to approach that, John. Yeah, we are. Thanks, Josie, and thanks to whoever asked the question. So um, again, another group I've chaired this week was the sustainability group, and, um, and we are beginning to draw uh, people together from across the organisation to develop the Trust Green Plan um, and requirements around net zero. Um, so those plans are forming at the moment. The, the, the plan is to conclude the work, and there will be a, a lot of comms going out as well to support the work that this group is doing, uh, again, over the next few weeks. We're looking to conclude uh, a revised green plan for the trust by the end of November um, uh, for presentation to the board in December. So that's the timeline we're working to. Um, and again, at that group, I was talking about maybe using the Arthur Chief Exec session, Josie, just to report back on progress with the work that we're doing there. And, and I know from previous experience in the trust prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of members of staff in the trust that are very, very committed to the green agenda and have got some great ideas. So we'll be harnessing all of that moving forward. Um, and absolutely, you know, this week, if you've been listening to the news with uh, Prime Minister over in New York, and we've obviously got, I think it's Edinburgh, isn't it, at a conference later in the year. It's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a, something that we do as an organisation have to take seriously and get involved in. And uh, John's um, really very up for that. So. Probably got one more, then I'm going to hand over to Geraldine. I'm going to use this one. With the announcement of flexible working to be offered to new staff from day one, how does the board think this will impact the NCHNC? Right, okay. Um, Liz, I don't know whether Liz, are you there? I am. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, am. Yes. Um, um, yes, I must admit, I didn't probably catch it on the news this morning, so <laughs> that's why I'm looking a bit blank, folks. I'm not infallible, sorry. <laughs> so but Liz hopefully will help me out. Yes. Um, so flexible working was one of the key pillars of the uh, NHS People Plan and um, actually within the work plan around flexible working, the trust had already in place most of the things that were covered by that plan and in our new policy we actually have day one commencement for flexible working for all employees. Um, we've already talked about what a challenging recruitment market it is out there. Prior to the pandemic, there were 20,000 nursing vacancies in England already, and that situation hasn't improved. So anything that makes us stand out as an employer has got to be good. Um, it also really supports our principles around equality, diversity and inclusion, and really helps to support and bring people into our organisation that perhaps couldn't have done otherwise. I do acknowledge that actually it makes planning incredibly challenging, um, but hopefully in terms of the, the systems that we have in place around things like e-roster really will help uh, managers to, to facilitate that into practice. But in terms of being a good thing for the organisation, a good thing for our staff and a good thing for our community, yes, I do believe it is. Thank you, Liz. I'm sure there'll be more on that announcement as the weeks go on. So I'm, I'm going to... Um, finish there because I know Joe didn't want to come in and close the session but just want to say thank you to everybody that's asked the questions um, as always some ones that let me scratch my head a bit but that's the beauty of this type of approach isn't it so thank you everybody I'll hand you over to Geraldine. Thank you Josie. I think I walked up the, the wrong way, so I'll never get my slot on uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, to conclude on the questions, and I thought I'd never get the opportunity today to use data. Yes, I'm 100% certain Stephen will advocate for community services. This journey and this recruitment has been all about continuity. How do we continue on the work we're doing? Us as individuals will all come and go, but our anchors to me are, we look after you locally with the values of community, compassion and creativity. And Stephen was appointed against that criteria. His values stood out from the minute we, we met him. His experience is across community, mental, and acute services, so really valuable into Norfolk, and that's at a, a very senior 
level and he's simply a nice man so this time the best woman for the job was a man <laughs> Stephen is my second appointment Josie was my first and the next few months will tell but I'm very very confident because it was a really thorough process I spent a lot of hours before we got to interview stage with many candidates and um, uh, I'm very certain. And, and although Josie said she didn't take part, do you think I would let Josie go without her having seen everybody I thought was good? No. Um, so Josie did have a, an, an input there. So thank you for all the very hard questions. And just a message from me this morning before we close, because I've got 100% of the housekeeping duties. Uh, it's getting a bit like being at home. And that's to all our staff, and by staff, I mean everybody who works with us to, to deliver. It is to take care of your own health and well-being. Take Carolyn's message and Venue's message from this morning about kindness. Spread kindness wherever we go. Uh, there's a lot of negativity around that a bit more kindness will, will clear out there in the world. And let, let us here be carriers of that. Uh, this morning, I just want to say thank you, and I hope I don't leave anybody out here to uh, comms and IT and all the wider teams for getting us here. Special big thanks to Elliot and Miranda who are in the room with us this morning. Uh, big shout out for all our presenters, my colleagues, Josie, Andrew, Venu, Carolyn and Andrew. In. And to uh, all of you who signed in, uh, I also want to say thank you. I hope you've got a lot out of the, the morning. And finally, this is Josie's last AGM. And we're all sad about that. But that's life. We've come to know and to love Josie. But I know you want to join with me in thanking Josie for her outstanding leadership during the last three years and some months. As Josie herself often uses the expression on NCH and C that we punch well above our weight, Josie has definitely punched well above her weight here for the people of Norfolk, the patients and for our own teams at NCH and C. And at Josie's heart is always that nurse and we will continue that work, Josie. We will continue to put our population and our patients at the very heart of all we do as an organisation. But we wish you well for the future, Josie, and we'll go on missing you for a, a long time to come. <laughs>